I'm Femi O.K. And I'm Malika Bilal. Today, will a truth commission in The Gambia bring its former ruler to justice? The country has begun hearings on decades of alleged abuses under ex-president Yahya Jammeh. Let us know your thoughts on finding truth and reconciliation in The Gambia. You can send us a chat live via YouTube or Twitter. Hi, my name is Lawade Shiambola. I'm a grad student and an entrepreneur at Yale University, and you're in the stream. Truth and reconciliation, it's what people in the Gambia hope to achieve through a two-year process of hearings into the alleged human rights abuses that occurred during the 22-year rule of ex-president Yahya Jammeh. Between 1994 and 2016, Jammeh allegedly oversaw gross human rights violations, including witch hunts, torture, enforced disappearances and sexual violence. Many atrocities are said to have been committed by his own paramilitary hit squad. Jame was also known as an eccentric leader who subjected Gambians to fake treatments for HIV AIDS. In 2016, he refused to concede defeat in a presidential election and has since been living in exile in Equatorial Guinea. So in this episode, we'll discuss what a Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission could achieve in the Gambia and how the country has changed under new leadership. Well, with us to discuss these issues in Bijilo, Gambia, Sharif Bojang Jr. He is editor-in-chief of the online news site The Chronicle and president of the Gambia Press Union. In Salaji, Gambia, Fatou Kamara, broadcaster, CEO and founder of the Fatou Network Online Media. And in Fajara, Gambia, Attorney General and Minister of Justice, Abu Bakr Tambadu. Welcome everyone to the stream. I want to start with a member of our community who tweeted in about this topic. This is Sambu Zheng with some strong words here of support. Sambu Zheng writes, the importance of truth and reconciliation commission in the Gambia cannot be overemphasized. It's one of the first steps we are taking to learn from the causes of atrocities committed under Yahya Jama's 22 years of dictatorship and this is the second week of the public hearing so minister i want to go to you you hear the strong support there on twitter from at least one person what for you is the aim of the truth reconciliation and reparations commission well the overriding objective of the gambia government in establishing the trc we call it as the truth reconciliation and reparations commission um, are several, but the um, the objectives are several. But the overriding objective um, for the government is to ensure that the abuses that occurred in this country, the human rights violations, the crimes that were committed against innocent people in this country, never again will reoccur in our country. Now, in order for us to achieve that objective, we need to establish the truth about how things happen, why they happen, who were responsible for making it happen, so that appropriate lessons can be drawn to put in place effective mechanisms to prevent recurrence. That would be the overriding objective of our TRRC process in the Gambia. But obviously there are several other reasons why we would establish the TRRC, um, the establishment of the truth. Mm -hmm. um, is fundamental, is the first step um, to ensuring justice in all its various forms. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I'm just looking here, Fatu, at the uh, Commission's Twitter page, and there's a tweet here, mm -hmm. on the road to establishing an accurate historical record of human rights violations for the last 22 years in the Gambia. I'm looking at the hashtags. We have truth, reconciliation, reparations, never again. Do those hashtags speak to you as a Gambian? Well, uh, yes, uh, uh, they do. Because definitely, like the minister said, we've been through 23 years of dictatorship where family members, colleagues, and friends were killed. Uh, myself, I was part of those who first went to Sierra Leone on a study tour of the truth and reconciliation uh, for Gambia. Uh, but uh, the problem I have with this whole uh, process is that Gambians are already traumatized. And if this was going to come two years ago when uh, Jamne left the country, to me, it would have been more beneficial because right now we're already traumatized and having to go through this process again, looking at people in the eye who will come out and say, I killed your parents. 
I think that would be a very difficult situation for us. And as much as we want to find the truth, uh, it should also be known that we're already a traumatized nation. I think it would have been more beneficial if the, those resources could be used for a nationwide uh, therapy for Gambians and, of course, to also take care of the victims that are here. Well, Fatou, if I may, I mean, we, we need to understand that in establishing the TIRC in the Gambia, we needed to go through a certain process of consultation and inclusiveness. I mean, this, the process that we engage in in establishing the TRRC is perhaps the most participatory and inclusive process you will find anywhere. We wanted to find out what ordinary Gambians feel about establishing the truth first. Uh, and also, there are several other things that we needed to put in place before the TRRC could kick off the ground. We were able to successfully do that. We had challenges, challenges uh, in terms of resources, both human and material. So um, that explains why it has taken um, two years in short for us to establish this commission. But finally, we're here. I think the commission will serve a useful purpose, as I said, in ensuring that what has occurred in this country under President, former President Jamis' 22-year yes. rule yes. will not occur yes. again. Yes. It's just to say that the Gambia is a very small country with less than 2 million people, and by now almost everybody knows the people who were involved in the killing, who were the junglers. So I think it would have been easier if those people who were involved in the killings are the targets here to kind of uh, get them to, uh, to talk about what happened than subjecting everybody to it. Well, let's not forget, let's not forget, if I may, that the junglers are just one group who are alleged. Um, to have participated in the commission of crimes. Let's remember that um, former President Jame and his aunt and his colleagues took over power in 1994. Uh, there have been several human rights violations and abuses um, committed since that period. Now, we need to treat all victims the same, not just the victims of the junglers who are more recent, but also the victims of former President Jame since uh, as far back as 1994. And let me just There's add, Minister, let me, let me just here. add for people outside of uh, the Gambia that the Jonglers uh, is the name that the paramilitary group who supported President Jamey, uh, that is his paramilitary group. They're connected together. Malika? Well, picking up on that idea, the paramilitary group and, and what, Fatu, what you described earlier as being a traumatized nation, I wanted to share two stories that we've gotten from everyday uh, uh, citizens, one Gambian, one Ghanaian. This is Ibu on Twitter who says, justice first before any reconciliation. We cannot let the criminals walk away while the victims' families are in pain. And for what some of that pain looks like, we actually heard from uh, an alleged victim. Uh, this uh, story was covered widely. This from Human Rights Watch, Gambia, ex-president tied to 2005 murders of Ghanaian and Nigerian migrants. So we got a video comment from someone named Martin Keir. He survived a massacre that was allegedly carried out by one of those paramilitary units that you mentioned there uh, that was also allegedly tied to the former president. This is what he told the stream. Yeah, I think setting up TRC is in the right direction because a lot of people in Gambia are now victims, they are in pain and they need justice. So I hope TRC will serve the people and the interest of the people is the paramount. So and I hope the Ghana government will collaborate TRC so that we can collaborate and bring Jame to justice. Our 44 Ghanaians killed in Gambia 2005 and we are fighting hard to find justice for those victims and I saw that TRC is in the right direction and I hope Gambians will see the fruit of democracy. So, Sharif, he talked to us about the victims and the pain that they are feeling, himself included. Talk to us about what that feels like, because I know for you, you went into self-imposed exile to avoid being killed. And, and before I come in there, I just want to comment on the, the tweet there about the issue of reconciliation and justice. I think this is very important, and I agree with the, with the, with the, with the person who tweeted that, because oftentimes in the country, especially from the highest office of the land, the presidency, this buzzword, reconciliation, reconciliation, always pops up. You know, everywhere you go, 
is reconciliation. And people attach too much reconciliation, the word reconciliation, to this TRRC. What has to be understood, and I, I, I am sure the Justice Minister will agree with me, is that um, there will have to be justice where justice is due. We can, we, we agree, and I agree that the country needs reconciliation in order to forge ahead. But then what we cannot ignore is the fact that there were some groups acts meted out to Gambians. And you can, how do you go to um, the daughter of a slain opposition activist, a politician, and tell them that you reconcile? Reconcile between who and who in a country where people who perpetrated all these gruesome acts against Gambians still in denial. People who witnessed it, Jamie, for example, the former president, his supporters, always deny that he, he, you know, he, he had a hand in each of these things. So in as much as we want reconciliation, we want forgiveness, we cannot impose this on the people. And I hope at the end of this TRRC, when the report is submitted to the president, for example, and the attorney general for implementation, they bear in mind that forgiveness and reconciliation cannot be imposed on people. Some people who went well, through a whole lot of things will have to, will have me. to you know, seek justice and will have to get justice. Yes, so if, if I may, if I may come in there, I think I, I mean I'm sure you will also appreciate that the our transitional justice process here is geared towards catering for all categories of victims. I mean certainly there are some victims who demand um, punitive justice, retributive justice. They want to see the perpetrators of these abuses um, taken to court, prosecuted, and and and, and appropriate the sentence. There is, we have to recognize as well, that there are other categories of victims who perhaps want restorative justice, who want um, to be recognized for their victimhood by their tormentors in a process that is seen to be impartial, open, transparent, fair, where everyone is given the opportunity, both perpetrators and victims, to come and tell the truth, the whole truth, so that this country uh, will know and what has informed um, or, or perhaps what has caused um, the deterioration of human rights in this country over time. It did yeah, not all I, I totally agree. Yeah, sorry for interrupting there. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. I mean, all these measures aimed at, um, you know, seeking justice for people. But then my concern is the issue of reconciliation. I mean, we can reconcile. Reconciliation comes out of forgiveness. So, you know, whatever, you know, well, implementation is it from this commission, uh, we should bear in mind that people, those who want to see their culprits, those who want to see those who perpetrated crimes against them in, in court, should be, you know, given that so, opportunity so to guess, see them in court. So, so guess, I just want to remind our court. audience, so guess, just give me a, a, just a, a slight pause here. I just want to remind our audience uh, what it has been like to live in the Gambia for the previous 22 years during the presidency of President Jamey. Afrobarometer asked 1,200 Gambians uh, in 2018 what kind of human rights abuses they may have suffered or may have endured. One in four so that they either did experience them or knew somebody who had. And these are the sort of things we're talking about here. Arbitrary arrest or detention without trial, torture, rape, brutalities by agents of the state, wrongful dismissal from a state institution, intimidation or harassment, disappearance after arrest by security agencies of the state, destruction or confiscation of property, state-sponsored murder, suffered at least one of these human rights abuses, 28% of Gambians. Malika, where do you want to take us next? Mm. Uh, to this tweet, uh, two tweets actually from Ansu, who says that people have an appetite for accountability for various reasons, but not least because it will help bring closure to victims and avoid the mistakes of yesterday. But as this been set out from the outset, not everyone can be prosecuted and not everyone can be compensated. But he brings up another point in his second tweet here in which he says there is also an appetite for the former president, Jame, to be held to account in the Gambia in a way that he denied us, i.e. fairly. So uh, I'll give this one to you, Fatou, because there is a lot of talk about whether or not this process, this Reconciliation Commission, will actually bring to justice the former president. 
Well, you see, Gambians are very forgiving uh, people, and I know that uh, lives have been lost, and I know there are people waiting for closure, but we're also hearing that uh, uh, there were certain people who were saying they would never uh, go to the TRC to testify against Jambe because to them, they think people have already moved on. Uh, that is what I was going to talk to Sheriff about when he talked about the issue of reconciliation. I remember when I was in exile, I was getting messages from people in the Gambia telling me, when you, kill, when you come over to Gambia, we'll kill you like a dog, because you were the people who were fighting to get rid of Gambia. But now everybody's moving on. We have all, you know, to me, I think people have reconciled. So that's why the truth and reconciliation, I don't know what else it, it will do uh, mm -hmm. at the end of it all. Fast, I mean, some of those if things... I may just clarify. Yes, just Minister, clarify. go ahead. Sure, sure. Yes, if I may just clarify that, um, you know, and I agree entirely with Sharif, uh, reconciliation um, or forgiveness cannot be imposed on people. And that is why um, from the outset we made sure that everyone understands that the TRRC is here to facilitate reconciliation between victims and perpetrators. Mm. And so a reconciliation will be a voluntary act. Forgiveness, as we saw with the first witness who appeared before the TRRC, who said he has forgiven his tormentors. I mean, that's the kind of spirit we're also looking for as part of the healing process. He has been given an opportunity as a victim to unburden, to express himself, um, to, to, to speak out about issues he has kept um, for over two decades. For the first time, he's been given an opportunity like this before the entire country to speak his heart out, and at the end of his testimony, he said he had forgiven everyone. And I think that's the approach the TRRC is going to take. Individual witnesses what? are going to decide on their own whether or not they're going to forgive or not. Our, our objective by establishing, one of our objectives by establishing this TRRC is to facilitate reconciliation between the victims and the perpetrators. Well, Minister, if you say never again, which is the hashtag that's being used, and now you have people coming to testify, and at the end of it all say, I have forgiven, how about the, uh, the issue of having people to, to do this again? And that is what you want to get rid of. Well, the um, there are, yes, there are a combination of measures. I think our TRRC, and perhaps this is the only TRRC um, anywhere around the world, which has been mandated to identify for prosecution those who bear the greatest responsibility. And that's why I said the process that we're engaged in here in the Gambia is geared towards catering for all categories of um, victims, including, including um, accountability in the traditional sense, in the sense of prosecution. So um, on one hand, while we want to encourage reconciliation, we want to uh, um, encourage forgiveness from victims. On the other hand, we're aware that we must not encourage impunity. Okay. And that is why we have tasked the TRRC to identify, again, as I said, for prosecution, those who bear the greatest responsibility. Okay, I, I'm really glad you said that, Minister. Uh, I, I want to bring Sharif back into the conversation. Uh, one of the aims of this commission is to identify people who should be prosecuted. It's not a trial, it's not a court case, but it does look for people who should be prosecuted. I'm just wondering, Sharif, uh, about the former president here on foreign policy. Uh, it says, Gambia's ousted dictator is living the good life in a palace in Equatorial Guinea. Uh, have people moved on, as Fatou was saying, or do they still really care that he actually gets some uh, justice? and people get some justice from the, the, the crimes that they suffered for him, or the alleged crimes? Well, I mean, whether or not he is living good life, I think that will be left to people who, who, who are witness to what he is going through. In Equatorial Guinea, I don't think he's living a good life. Being a president who loves power, who loves his job, presidency, and who loves brutalities and everything, but that's out of it. The question is, is Jami, you know, coming, is Jami coming to the Gambia or anywhere else to account for the alleged crimes that he's accused of committing. I think, yes, there is a lot of um, issues in the country. People are divided. I mean, some people, for example, will assume that Jame is out of reach because of the country where he is in exile, because of the president of that country, what he said to the French media before. But then I don't, I think I'm very hopeful and I want to remain hopeful here because I covered the Hissen Habre trial, the trial of former Chadian dictator in Senegal, the entire trial. 
in the run up to that trial, the same thing happened. This is in Habres, like the country was in Senegal, almost out of reach. You know, people, his victims died. Many of them died before they, they you know, he, he got to the court. A lot of people were hopeless that he said Habre will is out of reach and he will not face justice. But eventually he faced justice. And I had the opportunity of being in court covering that historical day when charges, when, when he was convicted and he was sent to jail. I think this is what is going to happen to Jame. People have not moved on as far as Jame is concerned. You know, he's far, far from the Gambia, but people are anticipating and people are hopeful that one day, maybe it's the next two years or it's the next, the next decade, Jame will face justice and he will eat the war that he wrote. Mm -hmm. uh, but well, what we are hearing, Fatou, I just wanted to bring this in because I, I just got this live on YouTube, um, picking up on the point Sharif okay. is making about the former president. People online are also saying that, of course, it wasn't just Jame. Allegedly, these things exactly. take, uh, they take more than just one person. This is Hope on the Air who says the Barrow government, and this is, of course, the current president, Ad Adama Barrow, is also following in the footsteps of Jame, such as corruption, lack of transparency, and bringing on board the same people who enabled Jame to commit all of those atrocities, allegedly. Fatou, what's your take on that? Well, uh, there are people, especially in the military, who people believe are part of those who uh, took part in some killings or torture who are still serving in the government. And in addition to that, there are also people who were working with the German government where there was said to be a lot of corruption. So those people we see also serving in the borough government. So that's why I don't know how this whole process is going to be. But at the end of it all, it's going to be very interesting because names were called during the commission of inquiry and those people are still serving in government. Sharif, the last time you were on, the, on the stream, yes, sure. The last time you were on the stream, Sharif, uh, you were looking forward to a, a brand new administration. That was almost two years ago. Now that you've had two years of this current administration in the Gambia, how are things looking? How is the freedom of speech, for instance? So this is um, an interesting question. Um, when Jamme, when Gambians came together to, to, to end dictatorship and to end the brutality of Jamme, and then came Adama Barrow. There was a lot of hope, a lot of hope in the country. I've seen, I went to the country the day Jamel left, and I had the opportunity of seeing him leave the airport. I look at young Gambians in particular, their faces. I've seen so much euphoria, hope that once, you know, finally, freedom at last. I mean, things move. There is a lot of things Gambians can be proud of. I mean, I'm a journalist. What used to exist before myself being in exile, a lot of Gambians being in exile, Inside the country, self-censorship, even saying hello to the wrong person at the wrong time could land you in jail, that, that's all gone. So there is a freedom when it comes to that. Gambian, young Gambians going back home to the country to, to invest, to set up entrepreneurial projects, that is all there. But when it comes to governance, especially transparency, I mean, this is not something that we are proud of with when it comes to this government. There is a lot of flip-flop when it comes to policies. Every single day there is flip-flop on major policies, on major policy issues, which Gambians are not. I mean, this is not what we voted for. This is not what we expect. There is, for example, like what the Justice Minister said. I mean, when it comes to this trial, we never thought that we could get to a stage where people who witnessed, for example, some of the atrocities committed during the Jammeh regime could come and say we've done it. Like this morning, the person who came in to give testimony said sorry at the end of the day for his, you know, for being part of the coup in 1994. But then when it comes to transparency, we don't know. The government is not doing what Gambians, what many Gambians, what myself, what I, what I would have what, like the government to do when it comes to I mean, like Fatih said, a lot of people, how do you live in a country, for example, key, our, our, our key ministries, finance and foreign affairs, former Jammeh finance and foreign affairs ministry, they are Gambians as the presidency, but we have a situation where the financial commission, the Ghana commission, that the mm. justice minister and ministry did so well to set up, for example, in, as part of the government, they, people will go there to testify, to, to say how they aided and abetted Jammeh and his administration, to take money from Gambians, to do corruption, okay. to steal money, to divert state resources. But then during the day, they go there in the morning to testify. And in the afternoon, they are at the highest office of the country, the presidency, to direct the president how he should govern. I think this is unfortunate. All right, Sharif. I would like to uh, come in here. Uh, and and uh, you Minister, you have one sentence to close up with because we're right at the end of the show. Can you do it in a sentence? Well, all I can say is, look, the Gambia... The Gambia is still in transition. Mm -hmm. It's been just, it, it's only been two years 
since um, the change of government. So, Minister, I think you're, you're talking about a young administration. Uh, that is your response to Sharif. Fatou, Sharif, thank you so much for joining us here on the stream. Uh, obviously, to be continued. Malika and I will see you always online at AJ Stream on Twitter. Take care.